Hello everybody, this is Monte Cristo, and as I promised on Twitter, I'm here with a vlog about the whole history of the Korean League of Legends scene to help illuminate what is going on right now between Kespa and OGN and Riot Korea and Spo TV because there seems to be a lot of confusion about the sequence of events and we're gonna have to go back several years in order to pack all the information in there. Uh, this is probably going to be a pretty long vlog and it might be boring to a lot of people, but it's going to go over not only the competitive history in League of, of League of Legends in Korea, but also a lot of the competitive history that happened in the West and NA and EU, because a lot of it is tied to, we can see where the development is at any given point in time uh, if we take that into account. So, gotta be long. Maybe a little bit dry, uh, but it's hopefully if you want to know more about this issue, you can be more informed and make your own opinions. I'm not going to take a stance on what I think is really right here or not. I'm just trying to explain the background of it because I think that both parties have had some valid points. And I think that Riot Korea um, is not wrong in everything that they're doing. So it's... Well, you can decide for yourself at the end. And of course, this video is going to be brought to you by Alpha Draft. So if you want to play some fantasy esports, especially with All Stars coming up for League of Legends, also do Counter Strike and many other games. So check it out. You can play for free. It's a lot of fun. I love doing it myself. So let's talk about the development of esports in League of Legends. So League of Legends was released in North America at the end of 2009. Now, it became very popular, Riot started making a lot of money from the game, and it really blew up as a free-to-play MOBA. It was a very fun game, I started playing it myself in beta. Uh, I actually was at the Riot offices d during the beta phase for a week because I had a friend who worked there, so I got in kind of in the game very early. And it was great, so it was no real surprise that it was popular. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to skip forward to when League really started becoming an eSport. Now, ESL in Europe was running Gopher Lols and other small cups, but it wasn't really until uh, much later on that we saw a true development of the eSports scene. Now, the first real, I would say, large event was the Hanover Invitational from IEM in Season 5. So that goes back all the way to early 2011. So we're talking about a year and a half of League of Legends at this point without kind of a major event taking place. And when I say major event, I mean um, an IEM, something that was sponsored by a major producer, either Riot producing itself, DreamHack, uh, which did host the Season 1 World Championships, I, uh, IEM, uh, IGN, which for IPL, uh, MLG, something along the this nature in the States. So DreamHack, of course, did host the Season 1 World Championship, which I would consider kind of the real, the first really big event that was held as a big LAN where it was offline. And that's where we're really going to kick this off. I may have missed one or two before that, but things didn't really get rolling, honestly, until Season 1. And I had been in esports for a long time, so I was watching the scene with a lot of interest for League of Legends because I love the game. So this is where I first thought, started thinking that League of Legends was going to become a big eSport. So that occurred in uh, June in 2011. So about halfway through 2011. So we're approaching about a two-year two year old game uh, at this point in time. And so this is, of course, the tournament that Fnatic won. Uh, there were a bunch of qualifiers run for it. And that's where the ball really started getting rolling in esports. Now, remember at this time, there is no Korean server yet. And we'll talk about the Korean server because a lot of the debate uh, between Riot and OGN is occurring because OGN feels that they helped to grow League of Legends as a partner. And that a lot of the frustration as to the splitting of the league comes from the fact that they feel they have been there from for League of Legends from the beginning. So at this point, there is no there is no Korean server. So we have the Season 1 World Championship. And then we have IEM Cologne uh, coming up right after this. This is IEM Season 6 in about August of 2011. And teams like CLG, Fnatic, TSM, SK were all there for that one. And then after that, we have IPL 3 in October and then MLG Providence in November of 2011. Now, I watched some of these other events on stream, but I wasn't there myself. So the first time I was actually in person at 
uh, an esports event for League of Legends was I was at MLG Providence. I drove from New York to be there as a reporter. I did video interviews for my website, GG Chronicle, wrote uh, content for the website, GG Chronicle. There were really no other press there at, at all at that time, uh, only a couple other people. And this, I can tell you the experience because League of Legends was still a very small game. Now, this was the second time that MLG had been to uh, or been a part of it. They had had Raleigh with League of Legends earlier. So that's actually their second time, excuse me. And so at Providence, League of Legends was still definitely playing a second fiddle to StarCraft II at the time. StarCraft II was the big game in esports. That's the one that was headlining uh, MLG and IPL and a lot and ESL and a lot of and IM and a lot of these other events. So it was really in the shadow, and it was sort of in, an MLG promise just on a side stage. There were only four teams there, so it really wasn't much of a tournament. So this is getting very close to the Korean server's release. So as we can see, when the Korean server is released, it's not like League of Legends is a major esport powerhouse in the West yet. Yes, there was a lot of, they were starting to get some decent, very good stream numbers, but nowhere near obviously what they're getting today. And it wasn't like it was a big force domestically in either North America or Europe that was going to instantly see success in Korea. So, Moving on, uh, Raleigh was in August too, by the way, of that same year, like the, the uh, IEM clone. So moving on, from that, we have the release of the Korean server. So this comes out in December 12th of 2011. So this is very, uh, this is about a little more than two years after the game launched in North America, and we see that it, now the Koreans get to play it. Now some Koreans, of course, players like Mokuza and Many Reason were playing on the American servers. They were well-known trolls uh, on that server at the time. So there was a, a precedent of some Korean players playing from Korea on the North American server, but it really wasn't a large style game at that time. So. This is, this is really important to understand because, again, this is about a, less than a month actually after MLG Providence, was, which I was at, and I can tell you that it was really, really not very developed at that time for League of Legends Esports. So, have the date, 12th of December, 2011. Now, on January 13th, 2012, so pretty much exactly one month after the release of the Korean server, OGN hosts the on game net League of Legends Invitational. And this Invitational consisted only of six teams, one of which was CLG from North America, one of which was WE from China, then four Korean teams, which is Najini Empire, Mig Frost, Startail, and Team OP. So Mig Frost is the team that went on to become Azubu Frost and then CJ Frost. So this is, you can see that there are a lot of seeds, and of course, Najin split into Sword and Shield and blah, blah, blah later on. So this is a huge undertaking, uh, by the way, and it was pretty impressive that they could turn around a League of Legends tournament only one month after the game's release uh, in Korea. Of course, a lot of the players that ended up playing uh, were playing on the NA server beforehand, but this is kind of what OGN does. So OGN is for just to talk about OGN now as a structure, because you have to understand what OGN is in order to kind of comprehend what's going on. So OGN is a television station in Korea. It is a pretty standard uh, cable television station. It's included in the majority of cable TV packages. So if you have cable, you probably have OGN here. Uh, it's also contracted to a bunch of different streamers, everything like that. Now, OGN is owned by um, an, enter an, an entity called CJENM, which stands for Entertainment and Music. Now, CJENM is part of the CJ, the larger CJ Corporation, which is one of the biggest companies in Korea. And CJ ENM does a lot of stuff with uh, the K-pop industry and uh, music production, and uh, owns a slew of other television channels, music channels, tons of tons of stuff. So they're part of that umbrella corporation, and that's going to become important when we really start digging into what OGN exactly did and what CJ did uh, for this particular this particular scene. Uh, and what they've done for esports as a whole, which we'll also go back to once we it starts being more relevant. So uh, OGN, right after the, the release, now I don't know this for sure, but I imagine, of course, that Riot was helping financially with this. And what OGN does is that when new games come out, developers will 
help subsidize OGN a lot of the time to develop leaks. Now, this, they didn't subsidize really Brood War at all. That was a different thing. But these days, that's kind of how it works. So I'm sure Riot gave them some money to help out with the production. They wanted, of course, um, League of Legends to start getting big in America. Now, at this point in time, there really wasn't much of an esports department at Riot. It's not, now there are tons of people in the esports department that help manage all these relationships. But at their, that time, there were an extremely small number of people. I would, I'm trying to think back, but I would say I'm almost 100% certain it was less than 10 at the time. Uh, maybe even less than five. So we're we're talking about a very, and that's in NA, not Riot Korea isn't here yet, really. So that's, there really wasn't anyone to say what OGN should and shouldn't do, uh, either Riot Korea or uh, Riot North America. So they're, they were kind of, I think, just given the money and allowed to create this league that they had a couple foreign teams participate in. Uh, it was it was a big success. The production value, in my mind, was better than anything else that was being produced at the time by its competitors at uh, ESL or DreamHack or um, and by ESL I mean IEM uh, because they produce IEM or MLG or uh, IPL. So pretty pretty good production value. We see that increase even further as the OGN continues to produce leagues. So then. We transfer into Champion Spring in 2012, which started about two months after the Invitational in March of 2012. Now, you have to remember that this is nearly a full year before the LCS begins. So the LCS is not a, a thing yet. It is just a, a twinkle in Riot's eye. And this is a tournament that CLG attended, um, most notably, uh, as far as the team went. Fnatic was also there. So there were, you know, a few foreign teams in attendance at this particular event, and they were mostly playing against, of course, the Korean teams. And they started out, they started the whole 16-team uh, system in League of Legends. So this runs for a couple months into May, and this is really the first major, like, multi-month, I mean, it's not really, it is the first major uh, long-term uh, offline tournament in League of Legends. It's uh, it's a tournament. It's not a league because Champions was a tournament structure for most of its for most of its time. So this is a this is a bit of an experimental phase for for um, for uh, OGN because there aren't any Kespa teams right now. There are teams that uh, were doing StarCraft II, like Star Tail in here. Najin was a new team. Mig, uh, Maximum Impact Gaming, where Frost and Blaze came from. Uh, but a lot of unsponsored teams are kind of loosely structured teams. So for those of you who don't know, because KESPA is now going to come into the picture, so you might ask, okay, well, what is KESPA? So KESPA is a governing and regulating body for esports in Korea that basically has a bunch of teams under its umbrella. And they're the teams you've heard of, CJ Entis, um, uh, KT Rolster, SK Telecom, now Spenu, uh, Samsung, so all the teams, like all the big corporate teams. And what KESPA does is that they help get sponsors for teams and they help maintain the sponsor relationships. So basically they take sort of responsibility for all the teams to make sure things are running smoothly and um, that broadcasts are up to standard, that their teams are participating in, and everything like that. So it's actually very important because that's where the really big teams are all affiliated with that. And even teams like Anarchy that are newer or that got into champions, now Kespa has kind of taken Anarchy under their wing as well, provided them with a coaching staff, they're helping them find sponsors. So it's a whole thing, like Kespa being part of Kespa uh, in Korea for most Korean teams. But you know the, the big names that have been in Kespa for forever, a part of Kespa for forever. So that's, we, interestingly, we have Kespa st start to step in in Champions Summer 2012, which started in July uh, after the spring season was over. And why this is important is because the first Kespa team to participate in Champions was a team that you know well called CJ Entis. So the weird thing about this whole situation is Remember that OGN is owned by CJ. Now, CJ also pays money to Kespa to sponsor this team. So they give money to be a, a, a Kespa team and they, they fund the team uh, that Kespa sort of oversees. So CJ, CJ 
OGN's really doubling down at this point, right? Because not only are they absorbing production costs, whatever Riot wasn't paying for, uh, they would get sponsors to cover it and absorb their own costs, but they also are doubling down. They throw their hat into the ring and they say, okay, we're not only doing that, we're getting a League of Legends division for CJ, which had been a team, you know, back forever since Brood War. So CJ here gets a team. So they are the first Kespa team to be a part of Champions. Now CLG comes back. Of course, Dezubu starts um, sponsoring Blaze and Frost, which CJ later takes over. All right. So now CJ has... OGN and CJ have a very large investment at this point in League of Legends. They're really banking on the fact that this is going to be the next big game in Korea, which it, it ended up being. It was a very wise decision, I think, from OGN. And the production value starts to increase dramatically. So then it moves into Champions Winter, which takes place in November of 2012. Remember, this is all pre-LCS. This is before any LCS thing ever happens. So it's also... Uh, this is now post the Season 2 World Championship, which was produced directly by Riot. So, And the Season 2 World Championship was immensely successful. Riot really was ramping up over the course of uh, 2012 in terms of their viewership. Uh, and it was hugely, hugely popular. So now we can really say that esports for League of Legends is going in earnest. But remember, there have been now three tournaments before the Season 2 World Championship that were all produced by OGN. And they were done with OGN deciding the format and with Kespa not being part of this league or their considerations at all. Very important to note that Kespa had nothing to do, really, with what was going on with League of Legends at this point in time, uh, to the best of my knowledge. But d without Kespa teams, I don't see really how they could have had much to do with it. So uh, I welcome any corrections on that front. So now we get into uh, Champions Winter 2012-2013, and now we start to see another Kespa team. So KT Rolster comes in uh, to this particular uh, tournament. Remember, Frost and Blaze are still under Izubu. CJ has another team in there. And we have both KT Rolster A, the team that would become the Arrows, and B, the team that would become the Bullets. So now KT's coming in, and they're saying, okay, not only are we going to start sponsoring a team, we're going to sponsor two teams. And that really starts, that kicks off this whole sister team thing in Korea, which will become really important in a few minutes because that's really integral to a lot of the conflict that happened between these, all these parties here in Korea. So uh, after that, after we see that particular tournament end in February, and this is when I get to Korea, so I have more firsthand knowledge from this period moving forward. So this is... Over three years ago at this point, this is when I started casting in uh, November of 2012, and now we're here in December of 2015. So Champion Spring was a really big change because now we have SK Telecom, and SK Telecom has been traditionally the most uh, celebrated team in Korean esports. They're legendary back from the Brood War days. They've traditionally been the most powerful team in StarCraft, and they're here now. They put down a big investment. They previously got Reaper's team for IEM Cologne that year, but they dropped them pretty quickly, and then they formed uh, the teams, th like, the, of course, the Faker roster and everything like that. Um, and that changes a lot in uh in terms of obviously they became the world champions in in season three so if sk telecom's getting involved then there's obviously big things afoot at this time cj acquires the rosters to blaze and frost so now we have three kespa teams each with two teams kt cj and sk telecom in the mix here uh for that particular season and again this is where kespa starts to uh, have more control over the league because they're getting increasing number of teams that are competing and now sort of the, I would say, the biggest name team in Korean history, which is SK Telecom, followed by KT, uh, are, are starting to get into the mix. So, and then that rolls into the summer season of 2013, immediately before the Season 3 World Championship uh, that SKT uh, T1-2 won. And now we have Jin Air there. Jin Air is here now. So there's another team that is under the Caspa Aegis that is joining the fray. Then Season 3 Worlds, obviously that's a big hit. Huge amounts of viewership, everything like that. 
So as you can see, for a lot of the early development of League of Legends, the Kespa teams were not really involved, and if they were involved, it was CJ, who was also technically running the League itself. So there was there was an investment, there's that double investment from OGN, and there really wasn't that much of an effect on the whole format issue that was coming into play. Uh, of course, this goes into Season 4, and of course, right at Season 3 World Championship, that's when Samsung gets in because they buy the MVP teams right before the Season 3 World Championship, uh, and that, therefore it becomes Samsung Ozone, the team that became Samsung White, uh, was there and kind of crashed and burned at the uh, at the Season 3 Worlds. So they were disappointing, even though they were very impressive, and had won a season in 2013 in Korea. So I, we can just kind of fast forward to the next year right now. So we have winter that happens immediately after the season three world championship. And we just kind of see more and more of these Kespa teams, Samsung, their debut actually in, in champions at this stage. So that's another kind of major player coming in. And then spring and summer too. It's just, it's sort of just an increasing number of, of teams that, start to become they either are represented by Kespa or they they start to become represented by Kespa. Uh, like I told you a story about the anarchy this year uh, wh whose coaching staff was provided by Kespa itself and of course the Tigers the Ku Tigers starting out as a non Kespa team but now they're affiliated with Kespa. So there's there's been a bunch of changes over time. So season 4 is where things start to get a little bit wacky. So this is 2014. So Increasing number of Kespa teams are participating in the league, and we also have a very important tournament, and this is really a turning point in the Korean scene uh, because of its relationship to StarCraft Brood War and the tournament structure that took place in StarCraft Brood War here in Korea. So, that tournament is called Masters. It started in February of 2014, and it went until uh, June. So this is really key because this shows what OGN wanted to do with the Korean system and the two team system that was existing. Because at this point in time, there were seven teams, IM, KT, Jin Air, Najin, CJ, Samsung, SKT, that all had two teams. So that's a total of 14 different rosters that were with these seven organizations. So they're willing to put out a lot of money to, to have uh, two teams and this is a league format remember every season of champions before this year 2015 was a tournament format qualifiers 16 teams uh it was basically the format of the world championship if you are familiar with that so basically double round robin in the group stage you cut it down to quarterfinals teams and then best of fives in quarters semis and finals okay so it was a punishing system though and uh, of course, it's not very conducive to sponsorship to do that. Uh, it's it's bad because if you have to have qualifiers, then and there were sometimes like KT arrows just wouldn't make a season of champions. So KT sort of lost half their uh, their sponsorship money because they weren't even visible on TV for basically two, three months. Um, and that was obviously not ideal and it was creating instability in the scene. So they wanted to run a long form league format. And now here's here's where something really crucial comes in because it goes back to Brood War history. So, for those of you unfamiliar with OGN's format in Brood War, OGN used to run uh, a league, a team league called Pro League. And you may say, okay, well, how does how does a one v one game like StarCraft Brood War have a team league? Well, SK Telecom. KT, um, Washing Oz, like a lot of these companies that were Kespa teams in the past, Air Force Ace, uh, some teams, STX Seoul, some teams, Wungjin Stars that don't exist anymore, uh, all had a large number of players, okay? So these large number of players would then compete in a format, there were multiple formats, probably the most famous of which is All Kill, where basically two teams, so SKT and KT, get together, and each of them puts out a player on a map. There's like a map list, and it's a best of seven. And if a player wins a game, they stay on stage. And then so if a KT player loses, then they have to send another one to face the same SKT player on a new map. 
So one player could 4-0 the other team. Maybe you have a best of seven with an ace match at the end with, with two players uh, going at it for that final, final spot. Um, the ace match was usually if they did a different format where they each put in one player to one map and then revealed them. So it wasn't all kill. But anyway, that was a different format that they did. And then it was a year-long league. So why did they do this? Um, they did this because it gave sponsors stability. Basically, you were guaranteed as a Kespa team to have a spot in this particular league that ran, and it would go for the whole year. So they would have like little playoffs for, for different seasons within that time. But ultimately, the big payoff at the end was this massive, massive, hugely hyped, big, big final uh, between two organizations. And so that was, that was the idea of the team league in Brood War. Now, the individual league in Brood War was called the On Game Net Star League or the OSL. Probably some of you have, have heard of this. So the OSL was very similar to Champions. Uh, it was a big qualifier among all the professional players. And usually, like the good broadcasts started around like the round of 32. So you had 32 players and then 16, obviously, then eight going up to the finals. But what this means is maybe SKT has five, eight players in here, and Samsung Khan has two. So there's unequal representation within the league, so it wasn't really that great for sponsorship. Um, and it wasn't that great for players getting stage time either, which I admit very readily was a problem with uh, the champion system prior to the implementation of the league. So what happened was, usually there were three OSLs per year. So you'd get these little tournaments that each took about two months, just like Champions did uh, in the first uh, couple years that they were running it here in Korea, three years that they were running it here in Korea. We had this little spike, and then, you know, it ends, and then a little spike. And then you have this long ramp time for Pro League that gets really, really big, but it takes place over the course of a year. So what this did was it created excitement because you could have two formats. You had the league format, which was great, leading to this big final and a year's culmination of a year's worth of effort from a combined group of players, not just one individual. And then you had a player like Boxer who could just like roll through the OSL and then, um, you know, pick up a title here while he's playing for SK Telecom over here for his team. So it was a really good way to highlight both the strength of teams and the strength of individual players, where you have some excitement coming from the OSL periodically over the year, multiple times, and then the big payoff with Pro League. So this worked really well, both for the fans and I presume for the sponsors. I mean, as an owner of a team, that really sounds like a good system to me. So if you missed Masters, if you're new and you weren't there at the beginning of season uh, four, so in 2014, there was a tournament called Masters. I cast it with Chobra. Um, it was a League of Legends team league. And this is like, okay, how do you run a League of Legends team league? So basically what it was is like KT and SKT come into a match. SKT and KT each have to field both of their rosters once. So they had to play uh, like SKT, K and S, and then KT had to play Arrows and Bullets. And then if it went to a third game, then what would happen is the, the teams could either roll out one of their rosters again. So you could see SKT K come out again if, they, if SKT wanted to. Or for the third game, they could mix rosters, any combination of players to, for that third game. So in order to have a team league to replicate the Brood War format in League of Legends, it was necessary 100% for each participating organization to have more than one roster. So the intent was this. So Masters came out and it was OGN's test run because what they wanted to do was to create a much longer team league uh, that would replicate Pro League in League of Legends. So Pro League was the team league in, in Brood War. And they wanted champions to be like the OSL. So you have these three little spikes. That's what OGN's intention was. Um, now this came to a head uh, after the season four world championships when uh, Riot Korea and possibly Kespa, I don't know who made this decision because I wasn't involved in the talks. I do know that OGN did not want the sister teams to go away because if we think back historically, they were one of the early adopters of the sister team system um, uh, with 
Blaze and Frost, right? KT was first and it kind of CJ came after that and picked up the Blaze and Frost rosters. So they knew from a production angle what they wanted to do. And the intention was to create a Brood War style system. Now, it has to be said, there were also other tournaments that were taking place on other channels. For example, NBC Game, which is a TV channel that no longer exists in Korea, created the NBC Game Star League or the MSL, which was sort of like the OSL, but it was on a different channel, but it had you know, a lot of the same players, but it was a tournament as well that, that happened. Um, but it wasn't affiliated with OGN, but other companies were creating StarCraft tournaments at the time. So at the end of season four, after Samsung White wins and Samsung Blue is there, I know personally that from conversations that the Riot NA team, the Riot HQ team and Riot in general was not too thrilled with the um, sister team system uh, for, you know, some legitimate reasons like possible match fixing. Uh, they, you know, the, you don't want to, they didn't, I, I don't really care. They didn't want a finals with uh, two Samsung teams, for example, or two SK Telecom teams. Um, but it was necessary in order to do the format that, that, um, that was envisioned by OGM. And they like doing the tournaments. So, because remember, they created this format and this is the format that, Korean fans were used to watching from the early days of League of Legends, back before Kespa got involved, back before there was really a Riot Korean Korea esports team, or really even a Riot HQ esports team, um, that was uh, trying to change things or impose their will upon OGN. So no more masters, basically. So that was in a, in a world where OGN got their way. Uh, this is the Masters would have been that year-long format, and OSL would have been champions for League of Legends, and they would have run a, a very similar system to what was going on in the like mid 2000s in in uh, in Korea that they were running, and they thought the fans would like this because obviously esports fans in Korea are familiar with the system. Blah blah blah. Um, so then we move into this year, 2015, where the sister teams are given up. Uh, OGN didn't want that to happen. OGN didn't want to run the format that, uh, that exists right now in terms of the league and because they wanted to do this other thing instead. But basically, they were told to do that. And this, this has upsides to it because if you want international tournaments, uh, it's very important to align the schedule because if we want things like IM Katowice and... Um, I am San Jose and MSI and Worlds. Like you kind of have to schedule around that and all the leagues have to be on breaks at, at approximately the same time. So it, it does make sense. There is validity to it um, if you want more international tournaments. Uh, obviously, there are opportunities for rescheduling teams so they don't play one week in Korea if that's going to be a problem, which has actually happened before for uh, events like IEM or MLG or stuff like that. But it is easier, I think, with um, with the more uh, aligned schedule. So that's kind of how the whole format change happened in Korea, which was OGN saying, okay, we'll do this even though we don't want to do it. And But it still created, obviously, friction because OGN has a decade of experience and it is, I think, OGN... Um, has shown that they know how to grow the scene. So you can see like over time what was going on with OGN is they started with a lot of creative freedom and it kind of slowly got chipped away at uh, by Riot, Korea, or Kespa for better or for worse, you decide. Um, uh, and now we are at the point we're at, whereas after a year of the new format and champions that there has been this whole uh, explosion with Spo TV who got Kespa Cup because last year when Kespa Cup, Cup was taking place, it was actually a uh, preseason uh, preseason league uh, that Doe and I were casting in December of uh, 2014, so about a year ago. So Kespa Cup comes in, Spo TV gets the right to Kespa Cup. Um, I did. I don't know why. I actually don't know why Spo TV got the rights instead of OGN, but that's what happened. Um, and they do a production here in Korea, and that uh, uh, you could decide how that went. Um, and then it comes to the fact that what happens now is that Riot Korea and Kespa and Spo TV want OGN to give up 
uh, half approximately of the broadcasts of champions. Now, OGN is obviously highly resistant to this because they it's their tournament. They were the ones who invented it in the first place and developed it and helped grow it. So there's a lot of passion at OGN for that particular aspect of, I mean, it's just, it's people have been working on this for years and they wanted to develop it in, I think, a partnership style and feel that perhaps they are being dictated to by outside powers at this point. And it's not really their product or what they want or what they're passionate about anymore. And Riot Korea, from what their statements have been, wants to split up the broadcast because they think that the competition will be good and they want to solve some scheduling issues. Uh, for example, just making sure that matches start on time so you don't have to wait for one best of three because it does make best of threes make schedules inherently unpredictable uh, because it could be two games, it could be three games. It's it's understandable that you would want to tighten that up a little bit. So that's that's their motivation behind going with with Spo TV as a as a different broadcaster. But it's not like in Brood War where there was OSL and MSL because these were two completely different products, right? MSL is over here on NBC Game, and it is its own thing. It is entirely self-contained. NBC Game runs it. The MSL they can do whatever the hell they want with it. And OSL is over here on OGN. So this is. I mean, this is a very different situation. It's not the same thing. It's not like OSL was split off and half the days were given to, to NBC games. These are two entirely different tournaments uh, that were creatively developed by their respective companies. So the weird, the weird thing to me about this whole situation is that OGN actually does have the answers to a lot of these problems already in that there is a new esports stadium opening early next year that OGN has constructed that has two different like stadiums in it, one of which has 800 seats, uh, one of which has about 400. And so basically OGN itself, if Riot Korea wanted to do a simultaneous broadcast, they're perfectly capable of doing this on their own because they have two different venues in the exact same location that could be hosting different games at the same time or if there was any overlap, one broadcast starting before the other one ends. Um, now, of course, you could ask, okay, well, how's that going to go on TV because they only have one channel? Clearly, there that's that might be a problem just because when one game keeps going, the other one starts, you kind of have to cut into the broadcast, maybe like you see on NFL in America where one game ends and it immediately goes into, you know, the first few minutes of another game uh, having been missed, uh, whether or not they want to do that. But OGN does actually have the production capabilities next year to implement the double broadcast uh, at the same time because they're moving studios. Right now, it would be difficult, but next year, no problem. So those were Riot Korea's main complaints, it seemed like, uh, was a scheduling issue and uh, also the competition issue, which I agree. I think that having competing broadcasts does create better content because there is a drive to be better than your opposing broadcaster. Uh, and I don't think there's a problem with that. But the issue is, is that it's it's OGN's league that is being split. Um, if they were to create a new league for Spo TV or do something like Kespa Cup, I don't think anybody would care. Um, but that's not actually the case in in this instance. And in fact, if in in my opinion, if there had been something like uh, like Masters that had existed or that had been allowed to occur and the two team system had moved forward and they had moved forward, they could have actually just put masters or an entirely different league onto Spo TV and just let them each do their own team. Because as a matter of fact, Spo TV is currently producing the StarCraft II Pro League. Uh, it's not produced by OGN any, any longer. The rights to that are owned by Kespa and they moved it over to Spo TV. So there was an option. So right, the way I see it is Riot Korea didn't want any more than one league. So they cut the possibility of a second league and now are trying to further subdivide the league that OGN ha has previously had the rights to. Um, and that's where a lot of this conflict is coming from. Should they want to create more tournaments or more content or whatever, then Spo TV uh, could easily do that. And I, I really don't think OGN would care because that's not what's at stake here at all. It's the fact that it's their league that's being split. 
And also from, I think from the perspective of sponsorship, it's really difficult to have one sponsor across multiple broadcasters because you don't, you can't control what deliverables are given by another broadcaster and who is responsible for bringing in that sponsorship and who gets what amount of money from that sponsorship. And I mean, that's just a nightmare to have sponsors across the same league on multiple platforms because that's the way that OGN has been able to uh, make money, basically, because Riot doesn't cover their complete costs for running League of Legends in Korea at all. So with that in mind, when you have a sponsor like, for example, this year, the Spenu Champion Summer or Olympus or Zubu or any of the other sponsors that have been major players in um, in champions here in Korea, how exactly do does that sponsor? The sponsor also doesn't want to deal with two different companies for everything. That's just a pain in the ass. So I think there's a big concern, too, about how sponsorship would even work in that scenario. Which, of course, then leads to more concerns about how exactly does OGN not operate at a loss uh, during the splitting of the broadcast. So I think all of these are the concerns that are coming in uh, to this whole OGN, Riot Korea, Kespa thing. I think there are very valid concerns from both sides. I think that this could be solved by having just giving Spo TV their own League of Legends content and saying, here you go, just go do it. But the problem is, is that everything in League of Legends has been um, so homogenized globally in terms of the leagues and the dates and everything like that, that it makes it pretty tricky right now. And the fact that Korea no longer has sister teams means that they can't implement the same formats, tournament formats or league formats that have existed in Korea for over a decade. So it's a really complex situation, and you can see kind of why all the parties, I hope, are, are getting frustrated by this. Uh, it, in my personal opinion, I, I think that OGN should be left alone. Of course, I have personal interest in that because I am a freelancer, but I am contracted to OGN, which means that I cannot broadcast on other Korean uh, broadcasts. Uh, neither can Doa, neither can Papa Smithy, neither can the OGN uh, Korean casters, at least at the present time. Um, so if these broadcasts do go over to Spo TV, it's not like Spo TV can reach out to me and Doa and then say, "Hey, do you want to come work for us for these days? You work for OGN the other days." Like that's just it's it's in violation of our contract, so we actually just can't do that. Uh, so that means that pretty much none of the casters will go over to um, to Spo TV unless you just somebody decides to make a decision to completely go over to Spo TV. Um, full time. Uh, but so th that is to say, I, I do have an interest in this and I would obviously I love League of Legends. And uh, I think that whenever I've worked with uh, the Riot HQ that they've never. It's always been a pleasure to work with their production staff, and this isn't some sort of conspiracy to get rid of me. I think that's actually ridiculous. Um, I, I have had positive experiences whenever I've w worked in conjunction with Riot North America at MSI or Worlds. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. This is a situation where Riot Korea is very autonomous from Riot North America, and they are given responsibility to make their own decisions. And Riot Korea is doing what they feel is best for the Korean market. Um, fans can decide if that's what they want or not. I'm just trying to sort of give all the, the info I can here. So I know this has been really long and boring, but I hope that it gives you a better explanation of how League of Legends grew both in the West and in Korea and how OGN, uh, I think, views themselves as integral to League of Legends development in Korea. It's not to say that they were the only thing at all. I think Riot did a fantastic job of making sure that the game was very accessible in the PC bongs, the internet cafes here. Um, that to the degree that when you play at a PC bong, like all the champions are unlocked, which is a huge draw, free to play game, right model for Korea, right kind of graphics, also a super fun game. Uh, so they did a lot right on themselves and it's not to say it wouldn't have become a big eSport in Korea with, uh, without OGN, but OGN definitely provided the television platform and everything to help get it out there and create a very, very successful professional scene in Korea. So that's kind of what has gone on uh, both before and since I've been at OGN. And I, I really hope I get to keep casting League of Legends next year. Um, 
If not, I'll be doing other games and I'll be staying with OGN uh, because I really like working for them and they've treated me extremely well. And there's a lot of work to be done, frankly, in esports right now across many titles. So I may, I don't want to move at all. I really would love to stay with Le the League of Legends, the game that I'm very passionate about, and I'll be extraordinarily sad if that doesn't happen. But, uh, you know, I don't really have a whole lot of control over this. So as you can read up on the statements, you know, I'll go ahead and link all the statements below so you can take a look at um, kind of what both of these companies have been saying because OGN has released statements, Riot Korea has released statements, and, you know, it keeps kind of going around. So I hope that by watching or listening to this vlog, you feel like you know more about um, the whole history of, of the competitive scene in Korea. Couldn't touch on everything. It's a lot more out there. I'm sure people make great points, but this is just a, a way for fans to who may not have been involved with League of Legends from the beginning of the esports scene to understand in context what exactly is going on here. So thanks a lot for watching. Uh, again, Alpha Draft, thanks for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you guys later.